day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. It was Lord, His kind behind our measure, gives unto each day what He deems best, lovingly its part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord Himself is near me, with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares He fain would take and cheer me, He whose name is Counselor and God. The protection of His child and treasure is a charge that on Himself He laid. As thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation, offered me within thy holy from a father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Thank you. You may be seated. Every moment of every day, our Lord is there to help us, and that is something for which we can give a great deal of thanks. Praise God for that. Now you recall that last week we had our fifth Sunday special, a video, a missions video on Ethiopia and Sudan. Fantastic video. I wish you had all been here for that. Uh, just incredible what God is doing in those countries today. And of course South Sudan is the newest country in the world. Uh, it has just uh, been made an independent entity. And this video was there on the spot, seeing all the things that are going on, uh, talking to believers who are there who have gone through tremendous persecution, those in Ethiopia under the communists and uh, those in Sudan under the Muslims. And it's amazing what God is doing in those two countries as uh, the gospel is spreading on donkey back and by foot uh, as people carry copies of the scriptures way out into the bush where they don't even know how many people are there. It's a fantastic, fantastic missions film. I hope you can see it sometime if you missed it. Now, uh, two weeks ago, though, we were in the book of Acts. We've just started Acts chapter 8. We've looked at verses 1 through 4 of Acts chapter 8, where God, using a persecutor by the name of Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, comes and attacks the church in Jerusalem and scatters the people abroad. And it says, Saul made havoc of the church. He entered into every house. He hailed men and women and committed them to prison. They didn't let the ladies off, folks. Uh, it wasn't just the men. Saul was putting men and women into prison. You wonder what happened to their children. It was a time of great persecution for the church. But the church that was scattered didn't just run away and hide someplace. They were motivated to obey what God had told them to do back in Acts chapter 1, where he said, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Finally, they left Jerusalem. It took persecution to do it, but they left Jerusalem. And they began to preach the word everywhere. Verse 4, 
Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. We saw how Saul's guilt was established. We saw the fact that not only was he guilty at the death of Stephen when they stoned Stephen to death, but Saul, now as a lost sinner, begins to persecute Christians and put more of them to death. It's also a reminder of God's methods of forcing compliance when his children don't obey. And we talked about the chastening of the Lord, you recall. Many passages deal with that, how God, when his children disobey him, he spanks us. I've been spanked on many different occasions because I knew what God wanted me to do and I didn't do it. And as a result, I went through some very difficult times because the Lord will not put up with disobedience. God expects his children to obey. We had a reminder of the order of God's commission. They were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. That's what we were told was going to happen back in Acts chapter 1. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And here we find it is being fulfilled as God forces them out of Jerusalem. We saw that it was a commission that was given not only to the apostles, but to all the believers, because God allows the apostles, according to the text, to remain in Jerusalem. And we see them still there when we find the Council of Jerusalem later on in Acts 15. They're still there in Jerusalem. He wanted the church to move out. He wanted believers to go and share the gospel with others. And we see many new churches being established in the book of Acts. We saw that God uses evil people to accomplish his goals. Saul was an evil man at this time. He was a self-righteous man, but he was, from God's perspective, evil because he was fighting against the Lord Jesus. And we'll find his conversion when we get to chapter 9. So tonight we move into verses 5 and following. The message is entitled, Samaria, Sorcery, Simon, and Salvation. We're going to spend some time on that business of sorcery. We're also going to spend some time on Samaria to see the grace of God. Because as we look in the text, you begin to realize as you look at the history of Samaria, as you look at the Old Testament, and you see where the Samaritans came from. As you look at the later history, after this great revival that takes place in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, what tremendous opposition they give to the gospel of Christ. You begin to realize that God is extending grace to these people in Samaria. Sorcery, we're going to talk about many, many different things that the Bible has to say. There are many levels of sorcery. There are many different types of sorcery that are spoken of in Scripture, are described in detail. And we're told who did it, and we're told what happened to them. So it's very important for us to know, because those types of sorcery, or witchcraft, or magic, are still being practiced today, and there are some Christians who stupidly dabble in those things. We'll get to that in a bit. So we're looking at verses 5 through 13 tonight. I doubt if we'll finish it all, but we'll at least start. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now you remember, Philip was one of the seven deacons that were chosen over in Acts chapter 6. In fact, he was the second deacon. The first deacon that was chosen was Stephen, and Stephen has just been martyred. And so now we pick up with the second deacon. And he is going to go and he is going to do some preaching in a very unlikely place in Samaria. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with his sorceries, 
For when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Now those few little verses that we've just looked at there, eight verses, open up a huge number of biblical doctrines in 12 different areas. There are 12 areas of theology that are covered in those eight verses, and within each of those areas of theology, there are many other areas that expand out from them. First, we see the composition of the church. That's something that's going to be a very important theme as we move through the book of Acts. We see in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, it is all Jewish males who trust Christ. And we discussed what are the indicators in the text that would show us that. Now we're getting over to Acts 8 and we have not only Jewish males, but we have both men and women. It mentions it several times in the text. We have both men and women. And we have not merely Jews, and those were the righteous Jews who had come to Jerusalem for the feast day as required in the Old Testament. Three of the feasts, every Jewish male age 20 and over was required to come to Jerusalem for that feast. But now here we have people who are outside. They are half Jewish and half Gentile. Their religion is a mixed religion that goes back to the Assyrian captivity in 722 BC. We'll see more about that in a little bit. So they have a mixture of Judaism and pagan religion blended together. And yet the gospel is reaching to them. By the time we get to the end of Acts chapter 8, we're going to discover that there is another person who trusts Christ and is saved. And he is 100% Gentile by birth and 100% Jewish by religion, but neither male nor female, the Ethiopian eunuch. And then we get to Acts chapter 10 and God opens the gospel even further to an oppressor nation, Cornelius, in his household. Gentiles 100%, pagans 100%, and of the Roman nation, which were the oppressors of Israel. And the gospel comes to them. And then we get farther into the book of Acts and we find some Old Testament believers, people who had believed the message that John the Baptist had preached and did not know that the Messiah had come and gone. They heard from John, the Messiah is coming. They had believed in that, but they didn't know he'd arrived and left. And so we find the Apostle Paul bringing them in to this one body, which is called the church. It's a fantastic progress of expansion as we go through the book of Acts. The composition of the church. The second thing we see, the content of the gospel and the magnificence of the grace of God. What is the gospel? What is the good news by which people are saved? It's given to us here in this text the content of the gospel, and then we see the magnificence of the grace of God. The third thing we see, which we've talked about in detail on Sunday mornings, is the gift of evangelist. Philip has the gift of evangelist, and we know that from what our studies have seen on Sunday morning. We find here the purpose of the spiritual gifts. We've talked about all the different spiritual gifts, or at least a few of them, um, still going through that study on Sunday mornings. But we discover here the purpose of the spiritual gifts. We find the spiritual gifts of healings and miracles mentioned. We find biblical demonology, witchcraft, and the many forms of the occult condemned by scripture. We find God's choice of battlefields in spiritual warfare. That's Ephesians chapter 6 that deals with that in detail. We find the evident marks of salvation. We find the issue of falling away after salvation. As you know, in the next few verses, Simon begins to um, get a little bit covetous of this power that Philip has and that the apostles have, and he wants to spend money on it. He wants to pay them so that they'll give him that power. And we find a very, very serious warning that is given to him by Peter. The issue of falling away after salvation. We find chastening in the sin and the life of the believer. We find the kingdom of God in the church. It's very interesting when we Look at verse 12, it says, When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. There's a lot of confusion about the kingdom out there, because there is coming a millennial kingdom, a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth. 
So we need to study what does it mean here when we're talking about the kingdom of God. And finally, the meaning and proper subjects of baptism. Now, since the remnant and the apostles were left behind to witness in Jerusalem and Judea, God took the very next key deacon, whom we've just mentioned, Philip, down to Samaria. Philip went to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. You remember back in Acts chapter 6, it tells us the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. I think we get a very important principle out of this, and I think that all men in church leadership need to learn this principle. Because the day is coming, as it has come in every country where the gospel has been preached, where the government will begin to kill church leaders, or arrest them and take them away and put them into prison. Every place the gospel has ever been preached, at some point this happens. I think we are very close to it here in the United States. It might happen tonight. You might not see me next week, not because I've gone on a trip somewhere, but because I've been arrested and placed in jail. We need to be very serious about understanding not only the imminency of Christ's return, and we look forward to that with eagerness and live holy lives as a result of that, but we also need to understand the spiritual warfare in which we find ourselves, and as we move into the last days, we're going to see Satan increasing his attack. So what's the principle? When you're in leadership, expect to immediately step up to the plate and face the battle when the man ahead of you is taken out of the game. Those of you who are elders, and I hope some are listening on the internet tonight, remember, you need to step up to the plate if anything ever happens to me. We find that Philip did that. Every man has a different amount of time to fight the good fight of faith. The devil will always try to eliminate the leaders. Be ready when your turn comes. Second, Philip was successful in a different way than Stephen's success, although there were some similarities. As we compare these two men, Stephen who has just been killed, and Philip who has now stepped up to the plate and is beginning to evangelize, we discover that Stephen was an apologist, but Philip was an evangelist. Stephen was given the gift of miracles, supernatural powers, but he was killed. Philip also performed supernatural miracles, casting out many demons and multiple healings, but he was not killed. In fact, we find him coming in later on down the road as we get down to Acts chapter 19 through 21. We find Stephen, uh, Philip comes on the scene again, and he has planted many, many churches, led people to Christ, built them into Bible-preaching churches, and he's doing it now all the way up in Caesarea. God gives us each a different time on earth. We do not know the day of our death. And every one of us needs to be prepared for it. Stephen faced evil Jewish leaders and false witnesses under the direct control of Satan himself. Philip faced a single evil Samaritan sorcerer and multiple people who were demon-possessed. You can see God moving in the same type of way, but not exactly with the same people. But he's giving the same kinds of tests to these men who have been deacons and who have been faithful in their service, and now they have taken the step up, as we studied in our study months ago on the offices of elder, bishop, and deacon, that a deacon who uses the office well gains to himself an ascending step on the staircase. He has moved from the office of deacon, he has moved up to the office of an elder, and he begins to evangelize with power. We see that illustrated for us with Philip here in this passage. There are three different words that are used for Stephen's supernatural gifts that are given here uh, for which he was killed. Stephen, it says, had power. That's dunamis. That's the word for dynamic power, explosive power. We get our word dynamite from that. It's power, power capable of reproducing itself, actual irresistible power like you see in a seed, internal power. And then it says he did wonders, that's teros. 
That's the word which means that which causes amazement. When people see whatever it is that happens, they are utterly astounded. Their jaw drops down. They stop dead in their tracks. The focus there is on the effect on the mind of the person who sees the miracle. And then we find the word miracles. That's the word semeon. That's the word that is translated most of the times as a sign or signs. The emphasis there is the authentication of the message that is being brought by the messenger who does the miracles. Miracles are not merely done for show. Miracles were not merely done in the New Testament so that people could be impressed. They were given to authenticate the message of the messenger. And so it says he did signs. That word is used 48 times in the Gospels of Christ's miracles. He wasn't just doing miracles so that he could wow people. He did specific types of miracles, which were signs, prophesied in the Old Testament that they would be the signs of the Messiah, that people would be able to identify the Messiah when he did these particular types of miracles. Forty-eight times it's used of Christ. It's used to describe the eight messianic signs proving that Jesus is the Messiah in the Gospel of John. John never uses that first word dunamis to describe the miracles of Christ. He only uses teros, which is wonders once, but he uses simeon in the Gospel of John alone 17 times when speaking of the miracles of Christ. And that should put us on warning that that's the reason Satan wants to counterfeit miracles. He knows that the purpose that God has for miraculous signs is to point to the message, not to the messenger, but to point to the message that is being brought. And so Satan counterfeits these miraculous signs, and we see that especially in the charismatic movement today. He counterfeits it so that he can bring in a false gospel, so that he can bring in false teaching, so that he can get Christians off track and sidelined, so that they become ineffective in truly serving Christ. That's why the test must always be the scripture. If they speak not according to the law and to the testimony, says Isaiah, it is because there is no light in them. They have to speak according to the law and to the testimony, that is, according to the word of God. If they don't square up with scripture, which is the final test, the final touchstone for all of doctrine and practice, if it doesn't square with scripture, it is not from God. That is the bottom test. Always make sure that it doesn't merely gloss over scripture and look sort of like it, but that it meets all the tests that God has given. Those three words occur in Hebrews 2, 3, and 4, which explains their purpose. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. First place, that's a direct statement concerning the temporary nature of the seven sign gifts during the apostolic period. But it also gives us the purpose for the gifts. God bearing witness. You see, this was prophesied by the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Back in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, Mark writes, and he says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Jesus is speaking here. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall lay, take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And then we skip a verse, go down to verse 20, it says, And they, that is speaking of these apostles, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. They would preach, and the signs would be given, so that before the New Testament was written, people would know that this word was from God. You see, the New Testament wasn't written in Acts chapter 1. We're moving through the whole book of Acts and different portions of the New Testament are being written, but the entire New Testament that you and I so wonderfully have today was not yet finished. And so during that period, the apostolic period, while the New Testament was being written, 
which is the final authority, God's written word, God was confirming his spoken word, the oral word, through the miraculous sign gifts that were given as the word went forth. And that's what it says here, confirming the word with signs following. Those gifts, remember, don't forget this. This is very, very important, especially when you're faced with people who are having experiences like tongues and so on. Remember that they were given to authenticate the message of the apostolic messengers prior to the completion of the New Testament. Whenever you take those verses in context, they only refer to the apostolic period. In Mark, it was the apostles who had failed to believe, and these signs shall follow them that believe. But it was the apostles who hadn't believed in the direct context. Listen to verses 10 through 14. Here it is, immediately after the resurrection. And so we find different messengers who have been to the tomb, the women first, and then later Peter and John, and others have gone to the tomb and the road to Emmaus and so on. You know, there are people who see Jesus, and they come back to Jerusalem, they tell the apostles, we've seen him, we've talked to the risen Lord. The apostles go, yeah, right. And they don't move on it. Listen to these verses carefully. She went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, listen to these next two words, believed not. Verse 12. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. That's those two on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. And went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. You get the idea? Next verse. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. We're dealing with a bunch of very, very hard-hearted guys here. And these are the apostles. It's the eleven. It says so in the text. You know, Jesus had preached to them for three full years. They had walked with him. They had talked with him. They had eaten with him. They camped out all over Israel. He told them he was going to die. He told them he was going to rise from the dead. But you know, when it came right down to push and shove, they were humanists at heart. They went back to the old way of thinking, when you're dead, you're dead. Now, God is going to transform those men, but they are the ones who believed not. And that's why Jesus says to them, those that believe are going to do these things. Serpents, drinking deadly things, laying hands on the sick, recovering, and so on. Take verses in their context. I mean, there are a lot of people today that do snake handling down in the south. I used to live in the south, lived in the south for a long time. And up in the mountains of Tennessee and in various rural areas of Alabama, there are churches that actually take rattlesnakes and copperheads and water moccasins, and they'll get into their charismatic frenzies in those churches, and they reach into those buckets, those pails that they've got the snakes in, and they take the snakes out and they hold them up and they wave them around like this. That is not worshiping God. We have an illustration of this snake business when the Apostle Paul, in his shipwreck, is cast up on an island as they're building a fire, a serpent comes out of the fire and latches on his hand and shakes it off in the fire and it kills the snake and Paul doesn't fall down dead like all the people think is going to happen to him. They know what kind of a viper that is. We're going to get to that later. I won't talk about it now. It's an apostolic miracle, apostolic period in which it takes place before the completion of the New Testament canon of Scripture. It's to confirm the word before it is written down. Many passages say that, and we've just looked at a few of them. Now, it talks about there, that Hebrews passage, it talks about diverse kinds of miracles. That means diverse, or different kinds of miracles. And we need to remember that miracles are distinct from healings. They are clearly set as different from healings, uh, which are mentioned in connection with Philip, and in addition to the different kinds of healings that he did. Uh, there are no healings, by the way, as you look back at Stephen, you won't find he Stephen doing any healings. He did miracles, but he didn't do any healings. 
We're not told what all the different kinds of miracles were in the days of the apostles, but they certainly included striking people with death. We saw that in chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira came in, all beaming because they had given some money to the church, but they had pretended to give it all, and they only gave some. And uh, Peter calls them up to the front, asking questions in front of him. He says, you've not lied unto men, you've lied unto the Holy Ghost. And as we might say, drop dead. And he did. Whack! Just there. Fell down the front. Young men took him out, wound him up, dropped him in a hole in the ground, and buried him. Two hours later, his wife came to church. They ran a lot longer services than we do. <laughs> came to church, and he called her up to the front. Remember, there's several thousand people here. It's not a little congregation like this. So she comes up to the front all beaming. Did you sell the land? Yeah. Did you sell it for so much? Yeah. And you gave it all to the church? Yeah. So you've conspired with your husband to lie to the Holy Ghost. They, the guys who just buried him are walking in the door. They're going to bury you too. Whop. She drops over. They carry her out. That's a miracle. It's not a healing. <laughs> Definitely not a healing. We find other miracles that are given to us in the uh, scriptures. We find smiting people with blindness. Elemis the sorcerer. We'll see him in a few more chapters in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul shaking off the poisonous snake into the fire and so forth. In the Old Testament, there were many miracles that were not healings. And they were also of many different kinds. You think of Moses' leprous hand, the rod that became a serpent, the ten plagues of Egypt, water to blood, millions of frogs, billions of lice, trillions of flies, plagues on the animals, boils on the people, hail on the crops with fire running on the ground, zillions of locusts, deadly darkness, and the death of the firstborn, the parting of the Red Sea, striking the rock for water and so forth. Those are all miracles, but none of those things are healings. The word for healings is not used of Stephen. But he did powers and wonders and miracles. And they certainly authenticated his message and they certainly refuted his opponents. Those same words are also used in the Gospels to describe the works of our Lord Jesus Christ as well as Simeon, which is the primary word that's used, the signs that Jesus did. But we find that Jesus said something about the coming of the Holy Spirit and what would happen at that time? He's speaking to the apostles. John 5.20 For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. We see that taking place in the book of Acts. Our Lord Jesus Christ does miracles authenticating his Messiahship, but he says, I'm going to give some greater miracles, certainly greater in number as we move through the book of Acts over a much longer period of time with many more people doing the miracles than were done by our Lord himself. He specifically said, I will do that when I send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which we've studied in Acts chapter 2. Philip also performed miracles and healings and casting out demons. That appears to be one of the key elements of Philip's miraculous gift. Casting out demons. I'm going to skip some things here because I know our time is precious tonight. We need to keep moving. Remember the lesson, the miraculous sign gifts were not for personal use. They did not protect the one who had them from harm. Paul, Paul had all of the gifts, but he suffered horrible abuse and eventually death by beheading, just like Stephen suffered death by stoning. The gifts are not for your own personal use and protection. They are designed to build up and to edify the body of Christ, the church. None of the miraculous gifts are being given anymore. Those were to authenticate the message of the apostles, and as soon as the New Testament was completed, God withdrew those gifts. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. He tells us that those things are going to be withdrawn by the Spirit of God, and at that point, tongues would cease in and of itself. It's used in the middle voice there. Don't fall prey to the charismatic stuff. You have service gifts still. There are gifts like evangelist and pastor-teacher. There are gifts like teacher, there are gifts like helps, there are gifts like giving, there's the gift of faith. There's the gift of hospitality. Did you know that's a spiritual gift? The technical term for the spiritual gifts is used of hospitality. There's mercy and there's ministration, there's governments and there's ruling. There are different service gifts that you have at least two and possibly more of those gifts. Come Sunday mornings and find out more. 
Now, with that background and that set of contrast, let's take a closer look at the text. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. The phrase went down means downhill because Samaria is geographically north of Jerusalem. It doesn't mean he went south. Uh, the mountains of Jerusalem are higher than the mountains of Samaria. He went down to the city of Samaria. The city of Samaria, very important place, especially in biblical history. It's known at various periods of history as Sebasta, Sebastia, Shomron. That name in scripture refers also to the first ten tribes under Jeroboam who rebelled against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, had a son who was one of the biggest fools in the world. Solomon had a united kingdom with all twelve tribes joined together. He kept the kingdom and expanded it from his father David. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He controlled the balance of trade between what we now know as Turkey and Egypt. But he had a son by the name of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam refused to listen to the old counselors that had counseled his father Solomon. And he decided to get young men for his counselors. The old men said, treat the people gently and they'll serve you forever. The young men said, no way. Put more pressure on them than your dad did. So he did that. And ten tribes, all the northern ten tribes, left under Jeroboam. Jeroboam became their king. Jeroboam realized that those people would want to go to Jerusalem for the feasts. And so he set up two golden calves. He set one up in Bethel in the southern part of those ten tribes. He set one up in Dan, which was in the northern part of the ten tribes. And he said, hey, you, all don't, you don't have to go to Jerusalem for worship for the feast days. Behold your gods. You've got some here. Just come on down to Bethel if you're closer to the south. Don't go all the way to Jerusalem. And if you're up there in the north, why, it's much more convenient for you just to go up here to Dan. I've got a golden calf up here in Dan, too. The northern ten tribes went into apostasy. There was not one good king during the entire 200 years that the northern kingdom existed. Not one. The southern kingdom, which was known by the name of Judah, the northern kingdom was known as Israel, and sometimes it's called Samaria. The southern kingdom had a few good kings, and so they lasted a little longer. They lasted all the way down to 602, 605, somewhere in there, when the first attack by Nebuchadnezzar took place, B.C. And then again in 597, then again finally the final deportation in 586 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. So it lasted a little longer because they had a few good kings, but the north never had even one good king that led them out of idolatry. I think we need to know a little bit about the history of Samaria so we can understand the grace of God in sending Philip to preach the gospel of Christ to the Samaritans. The city of Samaria itself was built by Omri. Not Ornery, but Omri although Omri was ornery. That was his capital in the northern kingdom. The books of Kings parallel the history of what was happening in Judah, the southern kingdom, with what was happening in Israel, the northern kingdom. So they tell you many times who was king in the, in the south when the northern kingdom changed kings because the kings didn't go on the same kind of a cycle. Some of them only lasted a few days before they were usurped and killed. But that's what these verses are about. 1 Kings 16, in the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, six, twelve years, six years he reigned in Tirzah. And he bought the hill Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill, Samaria. That's the first time the city of Samaria was built. Although the northern ten tribes were sometimes referred to as Samaria, the first time that that city was actually built was by Omri. Do you know who Omri was? Omri was the father of Ahab, who married Jezebel. Now, just from your general knowledge of scripture, was Ahab a good king or a bad king? Everybody who thinks he was a good king, raise your hand. Everybody who thinks he was a bad king, raise your hand. You're right. He was a very, very bad king, and he had a very bad wife. His wife was the daughter of Ethbaal, 
the king of Sidon. Ever heard of Tyre and Sidon? Ever heard of the curses against Tyre and Sidon that the scripture makes? Well, Jezebel was the daughter of the king of Sidon. It came to pass, as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. This is the place to which Philip goes to preach the gospel. The times of Ahab were times marked by fulfilling of great curses against God's people who rebelled against him. It says in 1 Kings 16.34, In his days, that is in Ahab's days, did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn. He set up the gates thereof in his youngest son Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. This guy actually killed his oldest and youngest sons in building Jericho and in dedicating the city and the gates. That goes back to a prophecy made back in the book of Joshua that Joshua had spoken when he destroyed Jericho. In chapter 6, verse 25, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. That's 1,400 years before Christ. That's about 600 years before the prophecy was fulfilled in the days of Ahab. It was a time of God's cursing upon his people who had rebelled against him. Never had a good king from 922 to 722 B.C. They were all very evil. So God judged the northern ten tribes. He sent a man, as we are told in scripture, by the name of Sargon. He was an Assyrian king. He conquered Samaria. He carried off, and we find different records, not only in the scripture, but there are multiple ancient records carved, carved in stella, stones that have cuneiform writing on them, that tell us of different conquests that the Assyrian kings made. And they speak specifically of the captivity that is recorded in Scripture. And tell us that Sargon carried off 27,290 of the Jews into foreign lands which he had conquered. Sargon then transported pagan Gentiles that he'd conquered and settled them in Samaria, where they intermarried with the poor Jews who were left behind to farm the land. You have the beginning of a mixed race here. The Bible tells us that there were at least three great pagan repopulations of Samaria during the reigns of Sargon II, Esarhaddon, and Ashurbanipal. They went through a lot, a lot of pagan invasions, a lot of resettlement, a lot of moving pagan Gentiles in, mixing their religions. They already had the two golden calves we talked about in Bethel and Dan from the days of Jeroboam. Israel had already added forbidden groves and high places for pagan worship throughout the land by the time this deportation took place. Of course, Ahab and Jezebel, we just read it, had introduced the worship of Baal. The pagans transported by Sargon brought additional pagan religion with them. Soon Samaria had a grotesque mixture of worship that included Jehovah as one of a pantheon of gods. They also had a mixture of Jewish blood and Gentile blood, and so they were scorned by the full-blooded Jews. With that background, it's no wonder that the Jews who returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity in the days of Ezra, Zerubbabel, and Nehemiah considered the Samaritans to be apostate adversaries, even though the Samaritans offered them at that time to help rebuild the temple. And those of you who are in summer Bible school know that's one of the themes that we had the building of the wall in 52 days by Nehemiah and the Jews who returned from Babylon, from the Babylonian captivity. Northern captivities were Assyrian, southern captivities Babylonian. But the Samaritans came and offered to help, but the Jews refused. Ezra chapter 4. 
When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asher, that's Assyria, which brought us up hither. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're okay. You know, we, we, we sacrifice to Jehovah. Of course, we also sacrifice to Baal, and we also sacrifice to this one and this one and this one. And but he's one of our pantheon. Sure, we say, we'll help you build the temple. And then we can come and worship here with you too. And bring all of our other idols along. Well, they decided not to. Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the God, the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Separation. You see it up on the wall. It's a biblical principle, Old Testament and New Testament. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord God, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God has called us to be separate and distinct from those who mix paganism with Christianity. I should have brought it tonight, but I received this um, little newspaper that goes uh, out to all kinds of people who have a complaint with the United Presbyterian Church, PCUSA, the group that used to be the PCUS from which this church broke away back in 1937. That church down the street there is still part of that organization. They were having their general assembly and in it they were worshiping Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, they have just dedicated a new hymn book which has very few hymns in it, but it has lots of pagan and secular songs which I would be ashamed to even read the words from those songs in this pulpit because of the immoral references and the slang swear words that they use in those songs. One of them is called the Red Solo Cup. And they think in that song that you're really stupid if you're taking the Lord's table with a glass or with bread. They want to drink out of a red solo cup. And they talk about incredibly gross and immodest things in that song. And that's what they sang to dedicate their new hymn book. Do you think we want that kind of thing back here, folks? I don't think so. But that's what's going on down the street, five blocks from us. That's what they did in their national assembly with all of their churches from all over the country. You can understand why Nehemiah and the rest and Ezra and Zerubbabel said, no, you cannot build with us. We will not compromise the testimony of the living God. And so, as a result, the Samaritans joined with the other enemies around the Jews to plot against them, as you know from the book of Nehemiah. And that hatred between the Samaritans and the Jews continued down to the time of Christ. In John chapter 4, we find it being evidenced. He, Jesus, left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And those of you who were with us in Genesis, we went through that entire history of the, the will of Jacob and how he divided things up and the, the incredible prophetic passage in Genesis chapter 49 that describes how he divided up things to the, the 12 tribes. But this is the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him. Now, with the background you've just heard about Samaria, you can imagine the woman's tone of voice. How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings 
with the Samaritans, John 4, 9. I wish we had time to go into the history of Samaria. I lived in Israel for a year. I've been through Samaria. Uh, I've seen a lot of very interesting things there. But it's a really fascinating history. They built a Samaritan temple like the one in Jerusalem. They made a copy of the Torah, the books of Moses, which they even to today, and they have very ancient scrolls, they claim today are more accurate than the Jewish Torah. They made a petition to Alexander the Great to avoid taxes in the sabbatical year, because he had granted that to the Jews, but he saw through what the Samaritans were trying to do, and he rejected it. In the wars with Rome, Vespasian killed more than 10,000 Samaritans. The Samaritans had greatly increased in number at the time Philip held the Samaritan revival here in Acts 8 when he came in contact with Simon the sorcerer. And there is a great revival, but by the 4th century after Christ, the Samaritans had become some of the fiercest and most outspoken adversaries of Christianity. Very interesting. In the middle of all that old history and all the stuff that follows Philip's revival, God penetrated Samaria with grace. That's fantastic, people. God reached down at a specific point in history and used a man who was unashamed of the gospel of Christ to reach a rejected people, a people full of bitterness and hatred, a people involved in all kinds of horrible religions, a people who had mixed the religion of the true God with paganism, people who had a bitter hatred for the Jews from whom the Messiah came. And with grace, God reached into their midst to save horribly messed up sinners. You know, friends, that's what he did for us, too. God, by grace, reached to us. You understand what grace is. You don't deserve it. It's the goodness of God extended to you, which you absolutely don't deserve. We were lost sinners. You and I were like the hated Samaritans, but God in the richness of his grace loved us and called us to himself. If you don't believe that, listen to what the Apostle Paul says about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And here's the reason, verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence. The book of Acts is opening up for us as God spreads the good news of his grace to the hated objects just north of Jerusalem, to the Samaritans. Oh, the inscrutable ways of God. He brings persecution on the church so that it will get busy with its job in reaching the people who are despised. I hope God doesn't have to do that for us so that we begin to reach people for whom Christ died, whom we stick our noses up at. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. I cannot see the clock back there. I do not know what time it is and I don't have a watch. How close am I? Two minutes, folks. Here we go. <laughs> as quick as I can. Oh, no, that was not speaking in tongues, please. Ah, 
The first thing that we notice here is the preaching in verse 4 translates a different word than the preaching in verse 5. Acts 4, where we have all the people going out, it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That word there in verse 4 is euangelizo. It's the word we get our English word evangelize from, to give the good news. That's the root word for the gift of evangelist, what we talked about in the morning worship service. And we know that Philip had the gift of evangelist because the text of Acts 21.8 says so. Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. We also notice that verse 12, that word is used of Philip in his preaching, euangelizo, when he's preaching and the Samaritans and Simon both believe. But we have a different word here in verse 5. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, the word in verse 5, wedged between euangelizo in verse 4 and euangelizo in verse 12, is a different word. It's caruso. It's a word that deals with the systematic proclamation of Scripture, what we would call today expository preaching. Euangelizo is used of everybody in verse 4. It's used of Philip in verse 12. But we find that when he went to Samaria, what he was doing was Bible exposition. Expository preaching is the foundation for evangelism. Then the Spirit of God, who is the effective agent, takes the Scripture. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It is as the Scriptures are expounded that God uses the Scriptures to draw people to faith in Christ. They need to know who He is and what He did. You can't simply go out and ask for altar calls after telling so sad stories. It says that he carusoed. That verb caruso is the Greek word which underlies the command to Timothy, karuxon ton logon, preach the word. That's the motto of Dallas Seminary where I graduated. That's the thing that they, they emphasize most strongly is learn to preach the word, expository preaching, systematic Bible teaching that undergirds all of Christian faith and all of Christian life and in the long run is the foundation for evangelism. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. People today don't want to hear about Bible doctrine. They want to have sort of a wishy washy, fuzzy, good feeling about God up there in heaven. They don't want to know too much about doctrine, but they just want to feel good about, yeah, I love Jesus. Well, we love Jesus. Do you know why you love Jesus? Do you understand the doctrines of the cross? Do you understand justification and imputation and propitiation and reconciliation and remission? Do you understand atonement? Do you understand the difference between atonement in the Old Testament and why that word is only used once in the New Testament, though it's used many times in the Old Testament? Do you un understand expiation? Do you understand propitiation? These are all specific doctrines that tie us to the cross and tell us what a magnificent work Jesus Christ has done for us and why we should love him and serve him. Keruxon, ton logon, preach the word. And that's what Philip did. That's what we see happening in verse 5 when it says that Philip preached Christ unto them. He was preaching Bible doctrine to them. Why is that necessary? Why is it necessary all the time in the church? Because Tim Paul tells Timothy in verse 3, the very next verse, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, some of you got dogs and cats. You know how the dog and the cat loves to have you scratch behind his ears. They just purr or they rub up next to you and they want you to scratch. You know, there are people in church like that too. They don't want to hear sound doctrine. They want you to tickle their ears with something they'd like to hear that doesn't make them feel bad. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned unto fables. Now listen, verse 5, because that's in the context of the exhortation Paul gives to Timothy, which is what we see uh, Philip doing here in the city of Samaria. Verse 5, after he's talked about sound doctrine, after he's talked about preaching the word, systematic Bible exposition, Verse 5, watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. 
These things are not to be separated. Too many people run around giving pep talks in churches and call that evangelism. That is not evangelism. Evangelism is preaching Christ and doctrinal truth about Him. Doing the work of an evangelist means preaching the Word. That word used here is logos. That's the same word that is used not merely of the scriptures, but that is the word that is used for Christ himself. We have the living word and we have the written word, the logos. That's the word that's used in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and so on. And then we find in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Preach the Word. What are you preaching? You preach Christ. He alone can save. Oh, dear people, there is so much richness in the scripture if we would only study it it's there and we just sort of skim the surface like a water skier zipping across never knowing that at the bottom of the lake there are millions of diamonds well our time is up for tonight Philip preached Christ it does no good to preach anything else Preaching sad stories, telling jokes, tickling people's ears with psychological drivel, teaching them how to shift the blame to their unkind mother or someone else will never produce revival. Philip preached Christ, the Christ of scriptures, the Christ of the Old Testament prophecies, the Christ of the New Testament miracles, the Christ that they found even in their Samaritan Pentateuch. For Moses spoke of Christ and Jesus said so. The Christ who had met the Samaritan woman at the well. Philip preached Christ who forgives sinners and who rescues outcasts. And God brought revival. Never forget to preach Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your marvelous word, the written word and the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us never to forget that he must have the preeminence. He must be first place. He must be the center of our lives. He must be the one who controls our thoughts and our actions. He must be the one whom we love and worship and serve and adore. He must be the one that we remember will someday judge our works. We will stand before him. Oh, if we're saved, we know we're going to go to heaven. But even saved people do lots of things that are very sinful and for those we lose heavenly rewards. And we cause shame to our Lord before a watching world. And we cause weaker brothers to stumble. And we bring guilt to our consciences. And we struggle with our emotions because we know what we've done is wrong. We have sinned against Christ, who had to die on Calvary's cross for those very sins. He reminds us of Peter denying the Lord, and it tells us that Jesus turned and looked at him. And then Peter wept bitterly and went out. How often have we sinned against the one who loved us so much that he took our place? Help us, Father, not to have to be forced out to witness as the church at Jerusalem, which was enjoying itself, which was having a good time, which had lots of folks in it, and they were having great fellowship. But you had commanded them to be witnesses, 
in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He forced them out. He gave them the motivation. You had given them the empowerment by your spirit and you had given them the gospel, the good news of Christ. Help us, Father, to be faithful so that we might with joy also see many others coming to the Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.